All right. <laughs> Welcome to the second round table tonight. I uh, don't need to introduce um, the panel. Just uh, one uh, little addition we have tonight, Klaus Beta, that you all have heard of uh, today already. Klaus Beta uh, originally started in uh, Frankfurt and he did the challenge and studied medicine and physics at the same time. And uh, actually graduated in both. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, then he went on to do this habilitation in physiology, still in Germany, and uh, shortly after that, about 20 years ago, a little more, 96, right? Yeah. In 96, he went to Chicago and he's there ever since. Okay, so please give a warm welcome to Klaus Beta. So, um, tonight we, we wanted to change the setting a little bit. Uh, we will keep it a little shorter up here in the front and include the audience after presumably about half an hour or so, so that you can bombard the panelists with questions as well. The focus will be on uh, the basis of neuroscience. Uh, go, go, go figure. Uh, what I mean is uh, uh, synaptic transmission, nerve pulse propagation, or wave in excitable tissue in general, like in the brain. Things like Vera and uh, Wolfgang here studying. So we have a, uh, a big front and a good lineup of expertise in front of us. So please welcome all the panelists from me before we get into it.
that depends on how large, how large the fraction is. How is it between us here right now? I mean, you're using sound, but um, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a lot of um, dissipation necessarily, right? Yeah. Okay, but would, I would agree with Thomas, uh, but I would say dissipation is not the mechanism. But it's, it's, it's an it's a, it's a e a evil side effect. This <laughs> is the point, it's an evil side effect. I think it's a necessity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, as I said, I think we need to get viscous uh, couplings into our account if we want to get quantitative, which of course are dissipative. Uh, we will talk about that later. Well, I think we should talk a bit later about that when we are going in some details in waves and other systems. Yes. Where yes. the dissipation is clearly obvious and the energy to consumption is given much more than in action potentials. Okay. Maybe I just. Thank you. Go on and say, Klaus, Klaus, Peter, what you are I'm using in your first I'm actually I'm is. I see your point and I see that the mechanics and the biophysics part plays an important role. For me, I have not made up my mind 100% whether this is uh, the major factor or not, because you have to think about the neurosystem has to be robust in terms of information transfer. So if you have right now several signals, you have the action potential, you have temperature changes, you have stiffness changes, you have uh, phase changes in, in the membrane, that's all associated and coupled together. So you can't really separate them. They are, they are tied together. Right now the question for me is always, what is the most robust signal amongst all of them? Because if you think about the optical simulation, I put quite a bit of heat there. I don't think that I get the information to the brain. The information travels whenever comes an action potential. So I see your point and I accept your point, but I am not sure whether we are on the whether we are missing something in, in that part. So that's what I have to say to that point. The question is uh, do these signs uh, between electrical and mechanical or how we how we how we feel the action potential or how we see the action potential? What, what is it? I, I think mean? it's both. Uh, I have uh, no objection by saying that uh, uh, its manifestation is uh, electrical. And uh, this is uh, an important aspect because when the action potential reach the nerve cell, or through the synapse and so on and so forth, uh, then uh, uh, the uh, the fact that this is an electrical wave uh, um, has some effect on uh, uh, potential dependent ion channels which exist and for instance for uh, releasing calcium and other things like that. So you need in fact the electrical signal as such if you want to see some of the effect of the action potential uh, at least at the end of the axon. So for me uh, it is clearly uh, an electrical signal, but uh, uh, it's uh, like looking at the uh, motion of an arm uh, of a hand. Uh, there is a displacement in space, but there are a lot of things inside which uh, contribute to the manifestation you see on the outside. So um, the uh, question I see is, uh, as you mentioned, I think and it was mentioned before, uh, what is the um, building block which is really uh, uh, critical for uh, the system to work and uh, I think there uh, must be, to my opinion, some, uh, in most of the cases, not uh, some uh, potential dependent kind of target. Not necessarily, if you take the digestive system, it's a calcium, it's calcium couple. Yeah, so, so that is a, I mean, it's self-regulated. You don't really have the nerve control over that part. So it's a different means of how you couple things when you transfer it. And that's also information <coughs> transfer because there's a concerted movement of your bowels. So they're not going randomly. So they transport the, the matter along your dry digestive system. So it not necessarily has to be an action potential on the other hand. That gives in your direction. No, I don't know. What is it? You know? I mean, for me, it's the issue that, uh, uh, that I, I, I uh, would like to see is that uh, there are some, uh, at the end, some mechanical forces which are involved, uh, like a sound wave, but not a sound wave, which would uh, 
uh, take place uh, without having the electrical signal. That's what I think, what you wish to see. <laughs> I wish to see. <laughs> I'm not sure if I have an influence on what I wish to see. But, um, uh, no, well. to, to my opinion, the, the standard uh, action potential, there is altogether the allosteric transition of the ion channels, which, to my opinion, their dynamics is imposing the speed. That's where the limiting is <coughs> something to discuss. But I think the limiting rate is the, the speed of the allosteric transition. Uh, and and uh, then you may have uh, um, some system where uh, you have communication without having the electrical signaling of the action potential. And perhaps in the cochlea, uh, 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 or some places like that, uh, you have sounds which propagate, and uh, maybe they do the same on the, uh, the, I'm asking the question, uh, you know, where you don't need uh, the electrical signal to have some effect. I think that was exactly your point. Uh, that it's all, that everything is always there and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say uh, what, what may need a major role can be different, yeah. I would have uh, an, uh, to, to add an energetic aspect nevertheless to that because uh, the, my question would be when I'm talking about an electron, of course, I agree, you have an, uh, a, a system which has a lot of assets and uh, it's not plain electrical and no mechanical, but my question is electrical signals as it's classically discussed include transmembrane currents, they, that means they need energy, they are dissipative, clearly. Mechanical ways are not necessarily, and no. that is significant difference. I agree, it is maybe a big difference. Uh, you see, because in electrical systems you cannot avoid dissipation, so you need energy by transmembrane currents. No, you can have a peer-to-electric -peer 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 wave, which is also not dissipative. Just if, if current flows through a resistor, then it's dissipative. Yeah, but the, the, this is the core of the classical action potential. That's true, that's true. This, that is, the core. That is, the, this is a point where we possibly can say, can we decide what, what's going ahead there? Do we have transmembrane currents, omic transmembrane currents, yes or no? no. I think that's one of the central, really a central question. This is for me at the core. Mm -hmm. it's actually, yeah, it's actually, it should we have on the list? I have a question. I had a discussion with a mathematician called Alain Carl, a very brilliant uh, mathematician, and uh, he said to me, uh, comparing uh, the brain to the computers, so why do you think that the brain are so slow? Why is the speed of propagation of the, of the signal uh, the speed of sound and not the speed of light? Uh, if God exists, then he should have selected the, the speed of light. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he, that was almost what he wanted to say. You know, I'm not trying to... So you have that, so, just so, this proven God? <laughs> I don't uh, speak to me about all these things. But uh, uh, just to mention that uh, uh, these are forces which exist in nature. They, they are actually acting on the photoreceptors and so on. And in the whole world, they are not used. So, what is your interpretation? Uh, my my idea is that the that the material that uh, the tissue is made out of has certain properties, and they allow for certain transport systems. As I told you yesterday, uh, diffusion and sound I was one of them, and the material property of that uh, it defines also the maxim yeah, yeah, maximum maximum speed of sound. I mean, the molecules as a collective yes. make the velocity, <coughs> not just an individual molecule, but the molecules of, as a collective the, um, <coughs> determine the velocity, yes, yes. yes. So is the but, 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 in fact, is imposing speed? Yeah. <coughs> which, the, and in fact, we have a speed of propagation which is inherited from the bacteria. And that's why we are so slow and so stupid. Because <laughs> if we had a brain operating at the speed of light, could you imagine what uh, we... Our, our head would look like a... Yeah, well, like it's like already be over, we would be a touch. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we agree on that. Uh, so let's go to the bigger waves. That would,
brain waves and yeah, uh, what's the situation same, and, uh, same spreading problem. depression? We have spreading depression waves. We have pre spreading depression waves, and it's very important. No waves in isolated membranes, but waves in connected tissue. These waves have a few par parameters. They are very slow, three millimeters or so per minute. Mm -hmm. They follow rules which are more or less identical to, or can be written uh, closely identical uh, to BZ or to. Uh, uh, HH model, um, but these waves are absolutely clearly uh, dissipative. This is very simple when you take out uh, energy, when you take out glucose, uh, these waves kill the brain within one wave. So meaning but, but Wolfgang, you know the experiments by Tasaki where he measured the temperature during yeah. a, a wave, which yeah. also yeah. seems to be adiabatic. Yeah, he, he so. showed, I know that you have shown, that people have shown, that of course with these waves you have a mechanical displacement, you have uh, even optical changes in the in the system, very very well to be seen. Uh, one of the nice things with the system, but nevertheless, you cannot get around the problem of energy consumption. This is simply there, so you must take into account uh, or go to BZ. In BZ, you have clearly waves. The mechanism uh, compared to a neuronal system, I think, is at least easier to understand. You just have a chemical mixture, which is a homogeneous chemical system. When you take a beaker there let it run, after a certain while, you, the, the thing is temperature increasing and waves die out, dot. So you have a wave propagation in systems which are clearly dissipative. They follow nevertheless the same rules as the action potential does. This is my basic problem, you see. This is why I ask, coming back to the actual potential, is there only transport across memories, yes or no? And there are some experiments one should not ignore, telling you that something like that exists because when you have a small neuron and that fires a few potentials, then without any energy, then you have a problem. And then gradients uh, go down when you have the actual uh, the, 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 the squid axon and you cut energy consumption uh, chemically, you can have a few thousand actual potentials. But again, in a small neuron, you just have a few. So for me, I'm coming back to that. <coughs> So these waves, uh, in, in a certain way, are comparable. Maybe the actual potential needs less energy, much less energy. I would be easily be, uh, like to live with that. Otherwise, they're obviously not that trivial, according to this point. Just one more aspect. On the other hand, you see, you must also see what the spreading depression history means. Spreading depression is a very specific wave, which for these people in the we will talk about that tomorrow a bit. It's a wave which it's also known to be uh, very important in migraine uh, story. Uh, so it's uh, the, the, the mechanical background, let's say, for the aura of classical migraine, among other things. So it's a wave in connected tissue. It has other properties. I'm not sure whether it's communication or whether it's not better installing a certain level of excitation on the brain. Actual potentials for me are clearly for communication. Uh, these waves in, in global waves in, in brain like uh, spread of depression waves uh, on my feeling are not essentially uh, the first aim to be communicating but to setting a certain level of excitability or switching off a certain level of excitability uh, so they may be just differently made but, but would you agree uh, if you have an experiment in which, uh, which you can excite and have even if it's just a handful Action potentials without uh, supplying energy, that the basic mechanism is obviously not dependent on energy. It's just for, this, for, the, for the system as a whole, probably necessary to feed in more and more energy, but the mechanism of propagation itself is, uh, is not dependent on energy anymore, then, right? If, uh, I can live with it, but again, but I'm, I cannot live with the fact uh, that. But okay, we can agree at that point that uh, there is no completely adiabatic, or at least no completely reversal process in nature anyhow, and so far. But this is a very general statement. <laughs> this is too easy for me, sorry. But if you want, if I really want to separate the mechanism of propagation uh, from uh, from dissipation, I think the experiment uh, to take the energy out and it still improves. Yeah, you still have proofs, it, even if it doesn't. If, how is it in spreading depression, anyways? Now, okay, it's spreading depression. The energetic system is very simple. Uh, either uh, when you want to run the system continuously, you have to support, for example, the retina, the, the tissue with continuous support of glucose as basis. But what you can do is you can go the other way around. We know that, for example, in spreading depression, ionic gradients completely collapse, different to action potential. In action potentials, when you look at the ionic gradients, we can discuss it later. But when you have a collapse of, uh, of gradients, and cut ATP out, then the system cannot recover. It's very trivial. 
So, meaning at least you need the energy to reestablish the gradients and the ionic homeostasis. Okay. There is no way out. And my question has always been coming to this point, do the ionic gradients in an action potential even change within one action potential? I know that there is a strict controversy in the field with that. And I know all the experiments and all the discussions about it, right? but I'm still believing this story is not yet really clean. Any, uh, any, if you go any, and if you look, for example, on the on the on the olfactory uh, hair cells, they beat all the time. And if you take them out, and you basically to clear the nose, if you take them out, the salon is the same, and the middle are the same. So if you put them out in a dish, even without oxygenation, without sugar in the dish, those cells run for ten hours. They basically don't change their uh, pattern that much. That means, for me, that they have to be extremely efficient in what they're doing. And they're doing a lot. They're doing much more than doing an action potential. So I don't know how nature really recovers the energy, because if I look on the plots in the Hodgkin Huxley publications, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> then you basically lose pretty much 95% of the energy putting into the system for getting out tiny little action potential. This is very robust. You lose but 95 percent over the length of one pulse. But yeah. if, you travel, yeah. if it travels along the nerve, you lose it that to the power of 10 or so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the point is you're losing lots of energy in that point. Does nature need so much redundancy or not? Because what it comes down to is redundancy. If I speak, if you read, everyone had done that experiments where you read a word. You only need the first letter and the last letter. Mm -hmm. Pretty much that's all what you need. And the, all the letters in between, that's all redundant information. <clears throat> you can fill this in very, very easily. And there's lots of tricks. There's text in German and English. Very, very fascinating. If that is, if, that is uh, if, if we are in our neural system as redundant as we're doing in uh, those uh, cognitive uh, measures, then I don't know how, we're, how much we really need in, in reality and whether this makes sense what we have right now as an explanation for the system or we have to really look for different solutions. I, yeah. I think we, uh, if possible, we want to go back to, um, to it, uh, concerning the Professor jean talk um, and receptors and how anesthetics work. Um, so, Professor Chanchet, could you do you see the possibility that the receptor could be more than one molecule, that, that it could be a patch of membrane or the entire postsynaptic membrane? Um, I, uh, <coughs> no, I'm not certain I understood the last part of your question about mm. so what what the nature of a receptor really is. I mean, you you you've tried what to is argue the nature? that if 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 the, if the receptor itself. Yes. Has to be necessarily a molecule, of or if, 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 the, if the receptor can be a larger part of the postsynaptic so membrane or patch of the membrane. <laughs> me to argument about uh, the occurrence of a receptor for general aesthetics. That's what you want me to do. Not just whether the no, whether whether a, a complete section of the membrane could also serve as a receptor rather than a single molecule. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, I think uh, there are a lot of arguments for that. Um, uh, the, uh, the simplest and very convincing argument is that uh, you have, uh, in the case of the GABA receptor, some mutations which alter the sites. Now you can introduce this mutation in the mouse with a uh, knock-in mouse. And you find that the mouse is uh, uh, not insensitive to uh, general anesthetics, but uh, much less sensitive. So you, you are able, through a mutation of a single uh, loc locus in this receptor, to alter the sensibility to general anesthetics. So that's a proof for me. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, I certainly find it an intriguing observation if you can manipulate excitability by manipulating a protein. But I don't know if may, that proves that uh, You may have uh, other ways of, uh, uh, of uh, changing, uh, but this has not 
uh, being fully studied and I think your question uh, may be uh, the origin of uh, uh, some following words. If you change the composition of lipids, for instance, are you changing the response to general anesthetics with this particular molecule? This has not been done, but uh, my guess is uh, why not? And uh, I think the, um, for me, the uh, enormous advantage of this uh, situation is that from a pharmacological point of view, you have a site on which you can work and design compounds. When you have a bulk effect, then you don't, you don't, you don't have a site at all. Now, the other uh, uh, aspect also is uh, uh, that uh, you may be uh, in a situation where you have some kind of competing receptors and that, and uh, you may have to find a way where uh, the sites are becoming very efficient because the other ones are silent. You know, so there is also a relationship between these different categories of sites, for sure. Because you have GABA receptors with general anesthetic site and some other GABA receptors without the general anesthetic site. So it's uh, the same thing for the benzodiazepine, for instance. So it is something which uh, has a lot of subtle properties that can be used to design Right. <laughs> um, so this, this then leads to a question to Thomas now. There are drugs which um, are used as general anesthetics and um, these drugs are, uh, exist in different optical forms, so-called stereoisomers, and um, these stereoisomers exhibit different potency in the, in, the, uh, in the organism. So how do you explain stereoselective uh, effects in your theory? Yeah, I'm, I think first of all, I don't think selectivity is the right word for that because the difference in affinity um, for whatever, um, uh, the difference in the effect of the different stereoforms of the, of the anesthetic is only about a factor of two, which is approximately the, the inaccuracy that you have when you determine the, the partition coefficient. So, so sorry, for, for etomidat it's 20 fold. I mean, it may not be a, For etomidat, which is a frequently used general anesthetic, which has a very specific stereoselective effect, it's about 20-fold. 20-fold? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that one, I have to, have to look that up, but, but should on the other hand also say that also the lipids of the, uh, have a chirality, which means they are all left-handed and, and might be that different, um, different um, chiralities of these molecules have different interactions with the membrane and different partition coefficients, so I could imagine that, but I don't know, one would have to measure that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, it would be a more, a more general approach, you see. And for me, the question is when you have a plain lipid membrane and you, you can uh, create certain effects, so you can have ion channels or so, um, then you can have gross effects of uh, physical chemically acting drugs at high concentrations. <coughs> what you have not is specificity at this point, uh, the, specific, the specificity as, as far as I know. Uh, usually comes into the business when coming from the byline, the reconstitution side, by putting in a protein which gives us the selectivity and the pharmacology. And this pharmacology, I do not mean at this point local anesthetics, I'm talking about drugs which are active at, let's say, picomola or so. Yes. There is no physical mechanism for such a concentration. There must be something else. And this would be my question, in, well, my question back to, to this point. Uh, can we have uh, a system, a plain lipid system, delivering us this high specificity to drugs on a physical chemical basis? Is that possible? I, I'm not talking about how the protein changes the system, but I'm just uh, postulating more or less. Uh, maybe we cannot get a, we cannot get out the protein because we needed to have this high specificity. And then we are back to this old question: when we have a low concentration of drugs, we need a. This is even in in I told a city, not directly, but it's even in Paracelsus already said that you have low concentrations, you need binding. So you're phrasing this as an impossibility, or do you, do you suggest that this... To go along with uh, what you say, which uh, I agree, of course, very much, 
is that um, in the case of uh, general anesthesia, uh, you want to have the uh, least side effects uh, because uh, if you have a drug which is acting in <coughs> everywhere, like uh, in the past it was with ether, for instance, which was a very bad general anesthetic, then the, the chance to have lesion or difficulties for recovery are, are very high. So the present general anesthetics which are used uh, have a very high affinity for uh, the micromolar range where we don't anticipate them to change the phase of the membrane at this low concentration. And um, I was uh, surprised to see at some slide, I don't remember which one, where uh, the uh, concentration of, uh, was between uh, uh, 0.1 molar or uh, uh, 0.01 molar, which is an uh, enormous <coughs> concentration. And I'm pretty sure that uh, as a general anesthetic, if you were giving them to the patients, you are sure to kill them by all means at this concentration. Don't you think so? I think that has to be... I disagree. Let's put it first, because that is a much more complex issue. If you go into anesthesia, the most important part for the patient is to get him out of the conscious stage into a deep anesthesia stage as quick as possible because there is one stage in between where they have that excitation. And you want to go over that. So that means you have to get the target your molecule, what interacts with whatever, either binds to a receptor or goes into the membrane as quick as possible to the target. That's the brain. If you have a fat person, then that's sort of my words, my harsh words, that redistribution out of the brain and the fat goes very quick. In the humans you don't see it that quickly. In the smaller animal, where the ratio is a little bit different, you see this very quickly. You bring the animal under, it's very quickly under anesthesia, and then it redistributes and goes in the fat. And then over time... Can you give 0.1 molar anesthetics under these conditions? I would give whatever the patient needs to really be under <laughs> anesthesia. And the point is, and the point is, you don't answer my question, so you don't want to answer it. But with a low anesthetic, it doesn't kill you, right? Because it's not the But point one mona, you know what it is? Yes. Here you see what could be cynical. You need one millimolar with alcohol, which is basically an anesthetic. You need one per mil. Yeah. You would put this in the fluids, and then it's basically the molarity of the extracellular fluids. You would, I mean, yeah. typically you wouldn't give that because... I, I mean, agree with you all in statements that you have to go quickly to the target in terms of force, but you have also to avoid side effects, and side effects are extremely serious in the case of generalists. Yeah, you know that better than me. So but if, if you're anesthetizing the earthworm, you put it in, put it in ten in ten percent alcohol, and, and that is much more than hundred million dollars. Try to do the experiment. Put the human, put the human in alcohol. So the other we can do this tonight. The other observation is, and the other observation is, which is important, which puts up to. Uh, also working on receptors and trying to uh, explain the anesthesia part is if you take isofluorine, which is used in the clinics, not at all as an inhalation anesthetic. If you give this to a mouse, in a mouse within about half an hour the neural function, and that is function of auditory system, other neural function is impeded. It's already largely changed. So if you want to study neurophysiology, as a floor, it would be the wrong anesthetic to use. On the other hand, if you get a yet larger animal, you have a grace period where you can work on that until it basically comes back. So the question is, it takes quite a short time to really target the brain, and it takes a quite longer time than to target the, the, the peripheral nerves. So the question is, is it then targeting receptors, or is it a biophysical phenomenon where the drug com or the compound actually interacts with uh, the nerves directly? I have a problem with that, because I think we are talking in the wrong direction. I'm quite sure you have, you have, you have simply two sides of the medal. The one side is we have substances 
which possibly are working on this physical chemical mechanism and you need high concentrations. And for me it's not a question whether I need 10 or 100 millimolar and we have substances which are not called anesthetics, I know that, but which work at concentrations of picomolar and then there must be different actions. In the one case I can live without a receptor or a binding thing. In case of this, um, let's say TTX or for example ketamine or so, without a specific binding it does not work on my feeling. Of course, ketamine is not an anesthetic, or I know that there are some controversies in the field. And also, TTX is not an anesthetic, but of course, it's working. Ketamine is considered anesthetic. Yeah, no, 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 that's a problem. But the concentration is very low compared, for example, to. For me, it's a question of concentration. This basic question, uh, what I said, what already was, uh, been, has been raised years ago. We have these two concentrations range, high, okay, physical chemical action, very low concentration, receptor binding action, classical pharmacodynamics. And uh, the one thing would be okay with saying I don't need a receptor, the other thing would be okay at least to say we need at least a binding site. And my question is, can a plain lipid environment deliver this binding site I need? Okay, I mean, we, 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 we promised we will include the audience a little earlier, so just, I, I wanna, but I, want to, I don't want to let you go with two little questions. One for Thomas is the action potential of solitone. <laughs> that, yeah, it's a trick question. I, I know that he doesn't want that, <laughs> and he wants me to. <laughs> to um, we call it in our original paper a solitary wave. Um, a soliton, strictly speaking, shouldn't dissipate anything when, when things um, penetrate through each other. And at least in our simulations, there was a minor, very small dissipation in there. So, strictly speaking, um, the term solitary wave um, is, is, is better. Um, if, you, <coughs> if you, however, um, loosely call it a soliton, uh, what it covers is that the pulse is localized. It's not a sine wave, it doesn't have several maxima and things like that. It is localized, it, it decays exponentially um, to the, to the wave, and in that sense I would say um, I stick to the term, at least um, as a solitary pulse. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to add some? No, no, actually I want to ask you, what do you think are the final big questions that you want to be addressed from us physicists in the field? In the future? Yes. Yeah, the after, after, what you have, after, after what you have, after what you have heard, what would you say is the big questions that you would address on the field in general, no, or particularly us? Uh, yeah, the big question I have, and uh, which is related to the, uh, the discussion we have, and uh, uh, the human brain program, uh, there was at some stage not anymore. Uh, the issue: you are doing good science. Uh, this is uh, something that you do for yourself, for, uh, but also for the community. And uh, <coughs> what is your uh, uh, idea about uh, the importance of your work for uh, the human community in general? Uh, I think sometimes physicists should ask the same question as well. About the atomic energy, it was a question. For us, it is uh, also a crucial question, and my answer was to try to find compounds which would alleviate uh, uh, most of the disease which are not treated by pharmacology up to now, and there are plenty. Most of the uh, uh, degenerative diseases like uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, <coughs> and a few others are not treated. So, uh, my question is simply uh, what is the important issue would be to try to see to what extent the work we are doing may be used to uh, find out new drugs to uh, help the human population and in particular the taxpayers uh, who are paying for our salaries. So that's what you are trying to do with your uh, I like your, your talk because also of that, in the sense that uh, it's a way to progress and the way people can hear. And uh, from uh, my point of view as a pharmacologist where 
I think the opportunity to say that those responses is really crucial, <laughs> as you said. We cannot talk about pharmacology without being, building a dose response curve. Uh, in pharmacology, there is still a uh, hand for receptors, and the role of receptors in the brain. And uh, I may note that you have been trying with mice compound acting on the brain of humans, and this is a real problem now, because many of the studies have been done in mice, and cannot be extended to humans, many, most of them. And this is a real problem for the design of new drugs. So that's, uh, so it's not that I want to say that we should do application of science, but we should do basic science, having in mind the possibility to apply them to develop new drugs. Then maybe with uh, Helmholtz would be a good, a good final statement for this. Uh, gave a talk once in front of, front of the medical community and he was both a doctor and a physicist and said uh, that, that um, the treatment of, of uh, medicine with physics or with natural science has done medicine very well. Let's continue with the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with this I would uh, let's thank the, the panelists and then uh, you are going to be included. If the retina waves can distinguish left and right uh, in racemic mixture of a drug, the answer is yes. Atenolol has the left and right atenolol, and we try both of them, and the retina has distinguished them. In this sense, it's better than HPLC, but we use high concentration, one millimolar, two millimolar, and so on and so forth. So that was what I want to say. So I'm an engineer, uh, nobody's perfect, um, and um, one thing that we try to avoid, uh, especially in mechanical engineering, is, is resonance, right? So any structure that's being built, any vehicle that's being built, you try to avoid resonance at all costs. Now biology is quite good actually optimizing resonance to its own uh, purpose, uh, especially in multi-physics problem. So the way I've been I got to think about this kind of duality between mechanics, uh, electrophysiology and, and you know, pH and all this stuff is potentially a slightly different spin. It would be to consider that um, evolution has actually fine-tuned all these physics so that they would enter into resonance for a particular purpose, which would be the propagation of uh, action of potential. So you could have phase transition of the membrane, you could have activity of ion channels, all occurring simultaneously within a given, uh, a very similar time frame, uh, potentially at similar velocity. Uh, the question is whether it's for redundance of, of, you know, if one starts to fail, then the other one can enhance the other one. Um, but I just wanted to pass that for you and, and, and see if that would resonate with, with, with you guys. Um, yeah, maybe a, a different way of thinking about it.
accepting of mechanical waves by basically polarizing exotons and taking them apart and letting the surf over the ship some 25 years ago, and at the end came light. So this was a, a photochemical or a photophysical reaction. And in the same sense, uh, you can make electrochemical reactions with uh, polarization waves. And I will talk about tomorrow how I imagine that actually in an axon you propagate polarization waves. And, and so in that sense, I think um, one has to really combine the various branches of physics and chemistry because we, we, we have electrochemistry and mechanics makes electromechanics. And that's why I use the term mechatronics because it's basically mechanics and electronics. And you can call it mechatronics if you then induce electrochemistry. And you can call it mechatronics if you want to uh, uh, catch light with it. And I really think these things are connected. And, and uh, if there is a way, uh, it's a cooperative phenomena or a, co a collective phenomena, which is very, very different in its behavior from the single particle phenomena. And what's and your think, question? What's your question to the. It's no comment. Okay. They say you give tomorrow. I think there are a lot of possibilities for addressing this can really make things uh, in the process in the world from the solar uh, through the exon to the synapse because we are carrying information in terms of mechanical, electrical, and chemical fields. I give a short comment to that on the oscillations and uh, linear and nonlinear processes. I think the next question for the physicist, that includes me a little bit too, is to really look on nonlinear phenomena in uh, interactions between mod uh, different modalities. For example, we know, for example, that if you take infrared light and you, in, you irradiate tissue, let's say tissue of the thyroid during thyroid surgery, there's a very tiny little, the, uh, the epithyroid, and if you lose that, that is very important for the per person to uh, survive afterwards. It loses, that is a big like a corn of rice, so if you have a very large tumor of the thyroid, you, often, you sometimes lose it. And there is an optical method right now to really visualize that, and that's an interaction between light and the tissue. And that is very like a non-linear phenomenon where you irradiate something and then there is some reflect, uh, there is some fluorescence back. And we know to photo on the imaging and so on and so on. These are all non-linear tissue effects. And I think that can be done either with light, that can be done with other physical modalities. And that is uh, dealing with uh, more complicated and not as simplistic models as we're dealing with right now. And I think we have a whole lot to discover if we really follow up in that direction and really are thinking a little bit out of the box and really trying something which might not really work and on the theoretical basis and on the experimental basis. <coughs> So, uh, my question is to the panel, uh, whole panel. Can't we have both uh, a propagation phenomena that is more akin to sound, uh, sound and also something that is more reaction diffusion like? So, for example, action potentials are maybe more like sound and spreading depressions are more like reaction diffusion because in the state picture they do not contradict. So, you can have uh, adiabatic or almost adiabatic uh, reaction diffusion kind of systems also. Like in the case of flame propagation, you, you still have to solve momentum equation and the equation of state together and th that's how you get the solution. I, I think I have lots of problem to accept that we have mechanical compounds, for example, in the actual potential. This has been said more than once here. For me it's a bit, really a bit a question bringing it to the bitter end, really to, to go to the core. is 
for example, this question, is the actual potential correlated to transmembrane transport or ion transport, yes or no? This question has to be answered sooner or later. Uh, I will try to answer it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but so meaning, uh, by sure, the, the one of any, any answer to this question is it will induce the other effects too. So by sure we have mechanical effects. The question is not whether they are the, most, uh, the more important or the less important. The question is really this point very much down. Of course, I can get around this question. Sorry to you, Thomas. I can say uh, there is no system free in, on Earth. On, on, at least a small amount of energy dissipation. But with that, I, this is a little bit, I think this is unfair in a certain point because it's getting around this question. Okay. Maybe I'm a little bit nasty at that point too, sorry. No, I actually agree with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> my my uh, thinking was that I think both uh, the reaction diffusion and the sound like propagation, they both fit in the stages so and you still have to solve momentum equation and equation of state. Yeah. May I say something yes. to that? I believe it's a matter of measurement. Um, is that, if it's dissipative, you would see that in, in the heat dissipation of the system. You measure that, right? And if you see a system um, um, that, that, that recovers the heat after the phenomenon, then you can say that the, that the, that the um, dissipation is small. Or you could say for a resonant system it has a high, I believe, a high Q, Q factor, right? And then you can basically disregard the dissipative um, parts because it doesn't, it's not really relevant for, for, for a few oscillations. I mean, if you look at a mechanical clock, yeah, nobody would, um, would hesitate to say that is a function of the, of the swinging of a pendulum. Now, but nevertheless, we wind the watch every morning, right? But we would never consider that as a dissipative process in the, because we wind it. Yeah? It's, a, it's an oscillation. Right. Which is mine with a very minor amount of dissipation in there. With, with damping. With some damping in there, yeah. It can be compensated, but, the, but the, the clock mechanism is not a dissipative one, it's an oscillation of the spring. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah okay, but. Okay. Uh, so, I would like to ask something very different uh, for myself and perhaps on behalf of some of the audience here who are. Uh, the similar age as me, so to consider ourselves semi-professionals. So there's something about what Professor Shonjo said earlier about uh, what you prefer scientists to be, to do more basic science and to be more uh, interdisciplinary scientist. But as much as I like that idea for myself too, because I've done many training, biology, engineering and physics, I'm finding it more in, uh, difficult to actually do many different things because in the environment today, it seems like many people are trying to do more and more specialized things. So I would like to ask all of you that do you actually find it important that uh, scientists in the future do more th different things? And uh, yeah, do you find do you find this true? And do you agree with this assessment? And if so, why do you why do you, why is it important? You allow me a shitty comment. Yeah. <laughs> with, with microphone. Okay. I think, uh, going now directly to biology, uh, I think you cannot avoid to, for, at least on my point of view, I, I, I would not accept to say I can do biology with a deep knowledge in physics and mathematics now. So I need some generality by sure. Uh, maybe some people can say, very specialized, I have been studying astrophysics and I'm focusing um, on this single point in cosmology, then this is a very isolated point. Unfortunately, in biology this does not work, I think. So we are talking about biology, about biological systems, and uh, fortunately, unfortunately, whatever you want to see, we cannot get rid of physics, we cannot get rid of chemistry, and we cannot get rid of mathematics, so we have to live with that, and so we have to live with this generality. I think you have to have both. You have to have those who are going into death, very specialized on the field, and you have to have the generalists. If you don't have the generalist, you can go to a parking reader, talk to a parking reader, that's the same effect. Because you talk and you don't understand. And that is, I, that's what I recognize if I talk to the medical people. That's a very special culture. And uh, physicists and uh, medical people generally have communication issues in the beginning. Vice versa. If I talk to the physicists coming from the medical field, same issue. So you have to have to learn at least the vocabulary of the of the other side, and then you basically situate yourself either on that side or this side. 
and that is an, a choice, it's a preference, and what your interests are, what your, what your target is, and then you can go in depth in that part. But you need both. You cannot say, oh, I do this because everyone is doing this. Don't look what other people are doing. Think about what is in what makes sense in the long picture, in the big picture, and then go it this way. And yes, if I multitask, and that's what I'm doing if I'm a generalist, I cannot be deep. I know nothing about everything. <laughs> And you know, and if you're a specialist, you know all about nothing. So, in, in, in that perspective, you have to... Yeah, I stop at that point. I think you would do this, right? I agree with what was said, and also with uh, what uh, you mentioned, we need specialists. Uh, this is something which uh, is absolutely true, but uh, we have to find ways of uh, associating specialists together to answer a conceptual issue. That's my point. And uh, I think, uh, let's talk about the... I don't see myself that there is a problem with the action potential, but here there seems to be one. Okay, but uh, <laughs> there, <coughs> there is one and I agree with, with you, because uh, the action potential was explored exclusively, almost, through electrophysiology and uh, computational work which is ignorant completely of all the proteins which are in the membrane and all the happening of uh, what's underlying the action potential. So there is a need there uh, to have, if one want to reinvestigate this thing, uh, to go to, down to the molecular biology, down to the chemistry of protein, down to the physics uh, of uh, signal propagation, but uh, and have these people working together. In fact, that's what we are doing, thanks to you here, trying to do at least, is to try to establish links uh, between uh, the different uh, disciplines we are concerned by a given phenomena. One uh, which is uh, necessary, to my opinion, is the outcome of all these studies uh, and the concept that we are aiming to solve has to deal with some human functions. So let's say for the action potential, and I would have been uh, pleased perhaps uh, maybe it's coming tomorrow, to have discussion on uh, where do they come from and what they are going to give. You know, it's okay to look at the physics of the action potential, but is it necessary to understand the effect on the target or not? And on the other hand, uh, how do you view the genesis of action potential? And uh, are some of the elements that you have in hand necessary to do it? So the, that's where I see uh, what you call the multidisciplinary approach, and uh, I am faced with uh, uh, the Human Brain Program to uh, issue is that many of the computational scientists working on the brain have uh, been working with models, which are either point neurons or uh, speed of propagation of uh, signal which are beyond 200 or 300 milliseconds. Why? Because their computational method uh, <laughs> are usefully uh, treated under uh, this condition no more than that. I don't think there is a... So it would be uh, extremely important if these different disciplines were really inspired or using what has been done in other disciplines as well to help them solve the problem, but uh, that's where I see we have to work together and try to find ways, and again I am repeating myself, the best way <laughs> is to have a good problem and try to solve it at all these different levels. Okay. I'm back on the microphone. Um, I'm co I, I, I wouldn't advise any strategic thoughts about that. I would just follow curiosity. If you find a problem interesting, follow it. And I think most people who have done big things have done that. I mean, if, if you ask um, what is a, 
what is the, um, the profit that society has from, from the work of Darwin, for example. I think at the time of Darwin there was no profit so whatsoever, but we probably agree that this was very important work, it well, seems from now, right? He holds uh, the descent of man, you know, so he, had, he was very concerned by that. Yes, exactly. When he, uh, he, he had the feeling that at the time he was uh, great problems. At the end he was extremely concerned by the future of humanity. Carlos and Connie, uh, I would like to bring uh, Sinon into the picture of general anesthesia. Uh, Sinon is uh, an inert gas, uh, so he cannot bind because it cannot lower the entropy. The only thing that Sinon can do is to increase the entropy in order to, to decrease the free energy and, the, and therefore to increase the affinity. So, I think other anesthetics behave like sinum, many of them. So my question is, is general anesthesia an entropy phenomenon? <laughs> well, in my, in my opinion, it is the freezing point depression law is a purely entropic effect. If, 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 you, uh, if you look at the uh, action of sinum or of anesthetics on membranes, the lowering of the melting point is purely entropic. There's nothing else behind it. No entropy whatsoever. No entropy? No, no entropy. Entropy. No entropy. Yeah, that, it's only entropy. Yes. Okay. Because because it lowers the free energy. The the you increase the entropy, and since the in the free energy definition you have a minus uh, change in entropy. Yes. Then it lowers the free energy, and there's, and therefore since the affinity is e to the minus de delta g then it will increase the affinity. So my question is, I think all the, all the general anesthetics work in the same way. Yes. And therefore it's entropic. Well, yes. They have the same target, yes. It's okay. not a target. <laughs> it's okay. just lipids. They have the same protein target. That's, right. <laughs> That's my answer. Okay. <laughs> you want to say something? Of course. Yeah. I'll say something short to every one of them. Uh, uh, reversibility uh, against dissipation uh, in the Hodgkin Huxley model the whole propagation comes from something totally reversible this is a local circuit equation second in all phases of physics Newton was totally busy with dissipation in every case you go through any case the things were reversible the action potential is reversible. It's absolutely reversible, and you always have in addition if you have no ideal condition. That is my answer, and I go to the next, and you, you oppose, and we fight. Uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, Thomas, I completely agree. It's entropy. And the key problem is who has understood entropy. And much of the discussion you understand when you realize. Uh, realize who of the discussants has understood the law of entropy. Einstein has understood it and put it on top of everything, right? So this is just an answer to that, yeah? It is based on entropy and not on energy. I can give examples. Now, specificity, surface, yes? Whatever you have, and one molar or whatever you have. First of all, the numbers are wrong. Just face it. We have three-dimensional concentration. We we'll almost talk about molar. What counts is at the surface. And it's totally different for protons, we understand. I, I don't I don't go more. The best specificity for uh, for uh, enzymes has been by, uh, by Fisher, Nobel Prize, and its specificity between right hand and left hand chirality of sugars. It's much more specific than anything else, this name of specific, and lipid biology or chirality. We proved that and it's a basis for the electrical sign. And Jean-Pierre, for you, my question is, uh, was there anything uh, of a big of first importance in science, which happened in the history of science, which once it was brought to physics and to exact science, and to a mathematical expression has ever been taken back. It was wrong, 
there were corrections, and the next step was again physics. So, uh, if this, what you do here, is physics, if this is, you can doubt it, if this is physics, it will be an incredibly big step opposed by everybody who has not understood entropy and who has not no hope that we get it. But do you agree that any big step in science, and if we are right, this is a huge, huge step. Maybe they will never do it. It all took centuries for other things. Will you agree that it was not one case that when physics broke through, no matter how the fights were, it was never taken back, not neither, neither Copernicus nor Einstein, nor I would say the entropy law in the, in the surface is doing this, but uh, this we have to debate. Would you agree that physics has the last word if it ever comes to? Okay. Do you want to give a short answer or you don't? May yes. I? May I? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very short, good. Uh, I believe in entropy, but I consider it extremely boring uh, because I have been doing lately a lot of experiments in non equilibrium situation and, for example, mechanics on the block sphere. Uh, if I would believe in entropy, uh, they wouldn't work because I would have to wait to the end and that everything is in the ground. No, that's not true. Oh, Who have you read no, you about don't. entropy? We we, which author? Which author have you read about? And I will show you he has not understood entropy. Okay, okay, so Lily has the last word. Nobody else. You all shut up. Or no drinks. My comment is very practical. I made a calculation, which may be wrong because I did it on a piece of paper, that if you drank five glasses of wine, and the, one, the alcohol is distributed equally throughout your body, it will be about 0.1 more than <laughs> 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 Let's test this test tonight. Dinner is going to be served soon. I want to thank everybody. So applause to yourself, applause to the panel, applause to the mic. I see you downstairs with the right amount of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs>